Let me introduce uh, Hee Han. He's from the University of Hong Kong. And uh, he's here today to talk about quadratically constrained myopic adver adversarial channels. I feel like the titles are getting harder to pronounce every week. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks, Pedro, for introduction. <coughs> thanks for coming. Uh, so very nice to see you guys after a terribly horrible weekend. So I hope you guys are all right. So. I'm going to talk about quadratically constrained myopic adversarial channels. Uh, <coughs> this is joint work with uh, Shashank Matitika, who was a postdoc in CUHK, and uh, my advisor, Sid Jaggi, and Anand Sawarate from Rutgers. So, uh, yeah, this is dedicated to my mom. So, what is quadratically constrained myopic adversarial channels? So, for example, let's say Alice wants to send some message to Bob. For example, she wants to send something like this, but unfortunately, this message can also be viewed by some bad guy, but in a noisy manner, namely some white noise is added to the message. So that's why we call him uh, myopic. And based on his noisy observation, he will carefully design a uh, noise and jam the communication from Alice to Bob. That's why we say he is adversarial. So let's call him James because he can jam the channel adversarially. So Bob receives some uh, adversarially corrupted version of the message and he wants to figure out what Alice wants to say originally. So what we did is to partially characterize the capacity of such type of channels with a different amount of shared key available to both Alice and Bob but not to James. So okay, so here's what's formally happening. So Alice has a message M it's a binary string, uniform binary string of length n r for some r between 0 and 1, which is actually called the rate, which we want to maximize, actually. Uh, and to fight against the noise between the, uh, inside the channel, she'd better encode the message in some sense. So she put it into an encoder, and the encoder is just a function. It outputs a, a, a real vector of length n. It's real, so it's slightly different from what you see in coding theory. Uh, and subject to some power constraints. So the output of the encoder x should have bounded uh, Euclidean norm. It has to, the, the norm has to be at most square root np for some number p given to you. And she just put it into the channel. This gets broadcast. And the James, James can also view this uh, message, but in a noisy manner. Namely, some Gaussian noise is added. Uh, this sz is just a Gaussian vector. Each entry id uh, with variance sigma squared. Uh, z is just the sum of x plus sz. And based on his noisy observation, he wants to carefully design some attack vector to jam the communication. And uh, this is the output of the jammer. Also has to satisfy the power constraint. The two norm of s should be at most square root n, n for some n given to you. So Bob receives the sum of these two guys, x and s, uh, which is y. And uh, based on this, he wants to decode. Uh, he output a message m hat. So ideally, we want it to be equal to m with high probability. Probability over everything, over the uniform distribution of, uh, of the message and the stochastic channel noise to James, which is just a Gaussian. And uh, potentially also randomness inside the s, the output of, of the function jammer. And also, some maybe there is some shared key between Alice and Bob. So in this talk, uh, Alice and Bob may or may not share common randomness. So if they share, we will consider a different amount of it. Uh, it will reveal some uh, different structure of the problem. So OK, so any questions? Is the model clear? So and it's important your M is uniform? Uh, it can't be arbitrary? I mean, usually we assume M is uniform, but I don't know. Because here we use uh, average uh, probability of error, so I think it's not no, very... That's exactly why I asked, because people may be more used to every message getting through, but this is oh, not Yes? Uh, maybe I'll answer this, but uh, if, if we're seeing like worst case behavior of the jammer, then why does the noise matter? Sorry? I mean, maybe you'll get to this, but I guess I don't understand why, if you're assuming like worst case behavior by the jammer, why the noise matter? Oh, it's important that uh, James does not know the full transmitted vector s uh, x. You will see why. So it will. 
so we will really leverage the fact that he's myopic. Otherwise, it's, it'll become very hard. If, if he knows exactly what X is, it comes down to sphere packing, which you don't understand. Is there a reason you're assuming computationally bounded or something? Yes, so everything is information theoretically not necessarily computationally efficient. So they have infinite amount of uh, computational resource, let's say. Any other questions? Okay, so, so before looking at this, uh, as Rory said, let's look at different variants of this model. For example, if uh, there's no noise to James, uh, James knows exactly what X is. This is, let's, let's call it omniscient channels. So James is omniscient. Uh, if you think about it, I want uh, vanishing probability of error. So every code word has to lie, in, lie within a ball of radius squared NP, and I want those decoding balls around each code word of radius squared NN to be destroyed to ensure there is no misdecoding. This is just sphere packing, right? Which we don't understand. Uh, the best lower bound of the rate or the sphere packing density is given by Blackman. Here I call it GV bound because this is the uh, analog of Gilbert Vashem bound, but it has nothing to do with GV. It's uh, due to Blackman. And the best upper bound is given by <coughs> Kabatinsky and Levenstein using linear programming bound. Uh, this figure is, uh, is the figure of rate. The x-axis is n over p. It's called the noise to signal ratio. n is the power of James, and p is the power of Alice. You can think of it as the noise to signal ratio to Bob. And the y-axis is, is the rate as a function of n over p. So these are explicitly uh, expressible, uh, some crazy functions. So on the other extreme, if the noise to James is infinite, uh, this is basically saying that James has nothing, James knows nothing about the transmitted vector x. Uh, or in other words, he has to choose x, uh, he has to, to choose the attack vector s before the code word is transmitted. So we say in this case that James is, uh, the channel is oblivious. In this case, we know exactly what the capacity is. We know the best rate, uh, we know the capacity. So again, this uh, curve is the uh, capacity. It exhibits a phase transition. As long as P is at least N, then positive rate is achievable. And it's given by this curve. It's actually half log one plus P over N. If you know, it is exactly equal to the channel capacity of additive white Gaussian noise channel. If I re so this quantity appears in uh, information theory because if I replace this adversarial noise with a Gaussian noise with variance exactly n, then the channel capacity is equal to this. But now these two channels are not comparable because these are two different type of uh, noise. But somehow they match if the if James is oblivious. Actually, this is a sort of general phenomenon happening in uh, information theory. Um, and if p is less than n, then no positive rate is achievable. So this requires some uh, information theoretic calculations using a typicality method or whatever. But this uh, characterization is easier to illustrate. It involves some, uh, something called symmetrization. So f to prove there, that there is no, uh, to prove that no positive rate is achievable, you just need to come up with a strategy for James such that under this strategy, uh, the probability of misdecoding is bounded away from zero, right? So what is the strategy? So James can do the following. Irrespective of, of what's transmitted in the channel, he just uh, uniformly at random sample a code word x tilde. He knows the code book and sample one code word. Uh, so with high probability, it's not going to be equal to x. And just uh, send it to the channel. He can't do this because p is, uh, large, p is less than n. So this doesn't violate James' power constraint. So what Bob receives is the sum of two code words. He has no idea which one is actually transmitted. So the probability of a responded so is at least a half. Given that x tilde is not equal to x, which is the case with high probability. If they are equal, then Bob has even less information. Yes, but we consider average, case, average probability of error. So we yeah, yeah, I, I just mean like it's, it, doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt the jammer if they're the same. Yes. Okay, so these are two extreme cases of the myopic model. So you can see myopic adversarial channel is, a inter is an interpolation between these two uh, 
uh, these two channels, we say it's uh, sort of interpolation between Shannon's world and he Hemming's world, or uh, in the middle point of average case error and worst case error. So now, now I want to talk about another primitive which uh, we have to use in the analysis, which also falls onto the bridge between Hannon, Shannon, and Hem Shannon and Hemming, namely uh, this decoding. So let's say uh, this decoding against omniscient uh, adversary. So again, some message is encoded into a, a code word and it's, it gets uh, broadcast. Uh, so there's no noise to James. Uh, James knows exactly what X is. And now I only require the decoder to output a list, which can be, may not necessarily have cardinality one, but uh, it's guaranteed to contain the truly transmitted message. And it's better be small, otherwise you can just output the whole message space is going to be trivial. So what do we know about this? Uh, in particular, it's just a trade-off between the least size and rate. So I'm going to give you a, an achievability scheme. Uh, for example, you just sample many code words, two to the NR code words, uniformly at random on a sphere of rate script MP. This is a code book. And you transmit one. Uh, some noise is added. Any noise of length script NN, so the received vector Y is guaranteed to lie within a shell of outer radius squared NP plus NN, uh, inner radius squared NP minus squared NN. So what does Bob do? He output, for example, uh, he receives Y, and he output all code words inside this noisy ball of radius squared NN, namely all code words on this cap. So the largest intersection of the noise ball and uh, the coding sphere is given by this ball, right? The radius, uh, the diameter is a line on the sphere. So we can compute the uh, ratio of the intersection and the volume of the coding sphere. This gives you something. You use this to compute the probability of error. It turns out <coughs> the least decoding capacity, so some rate is achievable. This rate is achievable. And it, you can also prove a matching lower bound, oh, sorry, upper bound. So the capacity is given by this quantity, half log p over n. There's no one here. So you remove the one from the uh, AWGN capacity. You get the list decoding capacity. Uh, so the channel capacity is different from list decoding capacity, which is not the case usually in the binary world, if you know. So this is uh, a folklore, but somehow we don't find any reference to this. Uh, okay, so now uh, maybe the most relevant work to ours is uh, by <coughs> Sauerte. He examined exactly the same model, but with infinite amount of common randomness shared by Alice and Bob, which is not uh, very realistic, but it is uh, something. And he characterized the capacity of this type of channel. This is a different figure uh, from what you saw just now. It's not a rate curve, it's uh, this plane, R2 is parameterized by two quantities. The x-axis is again n over p, the signal-to-noise ratio to Bob. And the y-axis is another uh, signal-to-noise ratio, sigma squared over p. You can think of it as the signal uh, SNR to James. So sigma squared is the variance of the Gaussian noise. N is the uh, power constraint of James, p is the power constraint of Alice. So in this figure, everything is tight. Uh, in the red region, uh, the capacity is least decoding capacity, half log p over n. In the blue region, some other quantity. We call it myopic least decoding capacity for some reason, you will see later, which is given by this uh, complicated formula. And in the gray region, no positive rate achievable. Actually, there is a minor mistake. Uh, it turns out uh, this blue region can be expanded all the way up to above this line of slope one passing one zero. You will see this later. If they share infinite amount of common randomness. So, okay, so these uh, red and blue region may require some non-trivial calculation, but again, the converse is easier to illustrate. You just need to come up with, a, with an attack. So what is the attack? We call it scale and bubble. So uh, to gain some intuition, <coughs> Excuse me. To gain some intuition, let's uh, begin with omniscient case. Let's say uh, James knows exactly what's transmitted. He knows X, 
and let's say he has enough power. What can he do? He can just cancel it out, right? Bob receives nothing. Uh, but if he has no, uh, no, he doesn't have enough power, he can still scale it down, but it's going to be useless because uh, Bob can just scale it back. He knows what x is. So what he'd better do, it turns out, he'd better use a portion of his power to scale down and a portion of his power to add some random Gaussian noise. Also with hyperbolicity, it's going to be roughly uh, orthogonal to the given vector and it's going to, its length is going to concentrate it around its mean. Uh, why is this good? I mean, I claim it's good, and you can also use this attack uh, for myopic channels. Instead of scaling down x, you can scale down z, the noise observation. Noise observation. Why is that? What does it do? It actually, uh, if you do the calculation, this attack actually turns the adversarial channel into an AWGN channel. So if uh, s is a scaled version of his noise observation z, and some Gaussian noise with carefully chosen uh, variances such, at, such that it doesn't violate its power constraint, then Y is going to be some scaled version of X plus some Gaussian noise. So this is a different additive white Gaussian noise channel with different power constraint and different noise variance. So we know exactly the, the channel capacity which is given by Claude Shannon. He told us this, uh, the capacity of this channel is half log one plus the power constraint divided by the noise variance. And you minimize over all choices of the, uh, of the scaling, it will give you an upper bound. It turns out it's tight. It matches the achievability result by Sauerte. So this is the right figure that uh, he, he gave. OK, so what do you really do? So if they share some, let's say, 0.2 n bits of common randomness, it turns out this is the uh, capacity. Again, in red, we have the same uh, myopic model, but Alice and Bob share 0.2 n bits of common randomness. Uh, in the red region, again, the capacity is uh, least decoding capacity. In the blue region, uh, something called myopic least decoding capacity, which can be written down. In the gray region, zero rate. In these two regions, we don't know, but we have some uh, non-matching upper and lower bounds. Uh, if you take a slice and draw the rate as a curve of n over p, this is what you get. So the black curve is the rate. Other, other curves are for reference. So what if I increase the amount of common randomness? As you can see, the blue region expands and which is not surprising because in some cases uh, larger rate is achievable. And again, you can take a slice and draw it as a, draw the rate as a function of n over p. So now if I reduce the amount of common randomness to only logarithmic, uh, the blue region shrinks, but still in many uh, regions we have tight characterization. Yes? Basically, do you know for a fact that the blue region is not everything? What is everything? Well, the, it's not, the white and the whatever, teal. Yes. The blue is not just, you know, really contain, containing those two things. Containing those? I, sorry, I don't I get the question. Is it bounded away from uh, the blue region? Oh, there's, uh, a bounds, there's a bounds, but I mean. Yes, yes. Uh, do you know it's kind of separation? Do you actually need randomness, huh? No, I don't. Okay. No. This is not the sharp uh, threshold. I don't know whether something else is achievable in these two regions. Uh, so maybe the most interesting case is that Alice and Bob don't share any common randomness. So it's going to be significantly different. Uh, both blue and red region shrinks, and the gray region expands. In the dotted region, we have no characterization. Uh, so, yeah, so again, let's begin with the converse. It's going to be easier to illustrate. The converse is, this region are the union of two half spaces. Each corresponds to a type of attack. So, okay, so, so if we want to uh, pull those figures together as we, as we increase the amount of common randomness, 
uh, the blue region uh, expands and it somehow converges to the figure given by Sawarte. So for the converse, this half space is given by the following symmetrization argument, which I just illustrate. You just, uh, irrespective of what's sampled, uh, of what's transmitted in the channel, you just sample a code word and add it to the channel because you can do this because n is larger, larger than p. And this gives you the following region. Uh, it turns out it only works when no common random is available. If they share common random, some positive rate is achievable above this line. So another half space is given by the following attack. What can he do? Instead of uh, sampling uh, another code word irrespective of what's transmitted, he can do the following. So, uh, so geometrically, uh, some code word is transmitted, and uh, some Gaussian noise is added. And James observes z, which is x plus some Gaussian noise. And he uh, samples some code word x tilde. And his attack vector is going to be the middle point of x tilde and z. So why is this good? He just add this onto x, and Bob receives y. And he uh, wants to decode. So this is actually turning the, if you do the calculation, y is equal to s, x plus s, which is equal to the average of two code words plus some Gaussian noise. If there's no Gaussian noise, again, the channel is symmetrized, but the Gaussian noise is nothing. It doesn't provide any information to the decoder. So again, uh, in some regime, uh, Bob's probability of error is going to be bounded away from zero. It turns out this is the, this is the regime where this attack is valid. OK. so. If we put three different types of attack in together, this is the upper bound on the rate, uh, which is given in this figure. Uh, yeah. It's the combination of scale and bubble, z agnostic symmetri symmetrization and z aware symmetrization. In some cases, these bounds are tight. For some configuration of uh, n over p and sigma square over p, and for some amount of common randomness. Any questions? OK, now uh, let's turn to achievability scheme. So, so I want to prove some rate is achievable. Uh, I want to prove lower bound on the rate. So the code construction is nothing special. It's just a random code. Uh, what's not true is the analysis. Uh, the code book is just uh, constructed as follows. You sample two to the NR code words uniformly at random on the sphere of radius square root mp, and th that's it. So some, again, geometrically, uh, some code word is uh, transmitted, uh, Gaussian noise added, and he receives, uh, James receives z, and he designs some s. Uh, so this is the y Bob receives. How does he decode? He just uh, draw a ball of radius square root n, n around y, and output potentially the unique code word inside this ball. If there's no code word or at least two code words, claim an error. That's his decoder. That's it. So the encoder is just a spherical code. Decoder is this bounded distance decoder, very simple. Uh, so now for some technical reason, uh, I want to reveal some information to James which he doesn't have access to originally. This is totally for a technical reason. There is no, uh, I mean, probably you can get rid of it, but I tried and failed. So if you have a simpler proof, that's all be, that would be great. But f okay, for, for now, let's, let's say some code word is transmitted and uh, James, is, uh, James observes Z. So from his perspective, all code words within that super, uh, super strip are going to be, oh, sorry, with high probability, the truly transmitted code word is going to lie within the super strip, right? Uh, because of the uh, symmetry of Gaussian noise. Now, uh, so with high probability, it lies in that, and I want to subdivide the super strip into small strips so that uh, the posterior distribution of x given z are equally like, are roughly the same inside the strip. So namely, uh, given z, the probability of this code word is transmitted divided by that code word is transmitted is roughly, is a very small quantity. It's given by some quasi-uniformity factor. So I want this quasi-uniformity. 
so I subdivide the strips. Uh, so what do I really reveal? I further partition these exponentially many code words into many subsets, each of two to the n delta code words for some small constant delta. So what I really did is that I partitioned these uh, code words for any, using any order. I partition them into subsets, each of size 2 to the n delta, and I reveal the one which contains x. So what James knows is the following. He knows the position of this small strip. Uh, x is guaranteed to lie within this small strip. And he also knows x is within these 2 to the n delta code words. So his uncertainty boils down to these 2 to the n delta code words. Okay? Uh, this is just for technical reason. Somehow it simplifies our analysis. So now here comes the main technical lemma. Uh, something called myopic list decoding is an in intermediate step towards unique decoding. So it says that uh, it is very unlikely for James to choose an attack vector such that it fools many code words in his uncertainty set. So what does this mean? So some, uh, so he knows that this code word, uh, x is within this strip, and these code words are roughly equally likely to be transmitted. And it's for any attack vector he can impose. For example, he choose this s and add it to the channel. Bob receives y, and how does he decode? He just draw a ball of radius squared n n around y, and output potentially a unique vec unique vector inside this ball. But from James' perspective, all these code words are roughly equally likely to be transmitted. He doesn't know which one is actually transmitted. So all these code words are translated by the same attack vector, right? So actually, from James' perspective, all these things are translated by S, and there are many, many decoding balls. So this lemma says that uh, for any S he can impose, uh, for most of these balls, they contain not too many code words. So there are 2 to the n delta code words inside these strips. Namely, there are 2 to the n delta balls. For 2 to the n, two to the n delta over 2 balls, they contain at most n squared uh, code words. OK. So this is not what we want, because I want unique decoding. But now, let's first analyze this. So how do we go about proving this kind of thing? So it comes down to, OK, so here is a ball. It comes down to analyzing the average intersection of the ball and the coding sphere averaged over this strip. So it turns out the intersection of this ball and the coding sphere averaged over this, this strip is concentrated around its mean. So, so you can uh, decompose everything into two directions. You can decompose every vector into directions along z and perpendicular to z. In particular, x has two components. This one is highly concentrated around its mean because everything is nice because there are Gaussians. This component turns out is roughly is approximately isotropically distributed in this strip, right? Because the strip is very thin, and uh, each code word is roughly likely to be transmitted. So this component is uh, approximately isotropic. So that allows us to compute the average radius of the intersection. Notice that the intersection is just a cap. So I can compute the average radius of this uh, cap. So you optimize over the decomposition of S. Uh, I don't know where, uh, I don't know the direction of S. You can optimize that. It turns out the uh, worst intersection is given by some uh, square root nR for some uh, random variable r. You can compute that. It will lead you to. Uh, those red and blue regions, ultimately. Once you know the area uh, of this cap, you can uh, compute how many code words are there using turn-off bound. So this will ultimately give you some myopic least decoding rate. is given by the following uh, region. But again, I. I'm sort of cheating here because it's list decoding is not unique decoding. But uh, before that, uh, it, these things can, al can also be lifted to the regime where common randomness is available. For example, if they share 0.2m common randomness, 
basically the same argument also uh, works. But okay, here comes two uses of common randomness. Uh, the first use, as far as I know, there are uh, at least two uses of common randomness in communication. Uh, if you have a point-to-point -point one way communication system, if you have a code which is least decodable with log n bits of common randomness, this list can be disambiguated. Uh, why is that? It's not trivial. It's given by uh, Mike Langberg and Sauerte in his thesis. Uh, this is a very useful fact using some sort of Ramsey theoretic thing. Uh, the second use, uh, which is tailored for our model, my myopic model, is that uh, if James is not sufficiently myopic, uh, for example, uh, so So basically, in those regions, we only know how to analyze the capacity when James is sufficiently myopic, so that his uncertainty set contains many, many code words, contains exponentially many code words, so that we can subdivide it into many small subsets and do something. If his uncertainty, uncertainty set only contains one code word, he's omniscient. This comes down to uh, sphere packing, which we don't understand. So uh, if he's not myopic, we want to make him myopic using common randomness. How, uh, for example, if this is too large, he's not that myopic, right? I want, I better want, this is at most this. But if it's not the case, he's not very myopic, I need these many bits of common randomness to myopify him. How? Uh, Alice and Bob can co corporately create many copies of uh, code books. So this is a code book of size 2 to the nr. They share, they share some key. And they can create many copies. They create 2 to the n these many copies. Exponentially many copies of code books. Because Alice and Bob share some common randomness, they can specify one code book they are using. So Bob knows which code book he's using. But from James' perspective, his book code book is very large, is this. So from his perspective, the, the number of code words in his uncertainty set is very large, is exponentially large. So again, it's his myopic again. So the analysis goes through. So the crucial point is that we want exponentially many code words inside his uh, uncertainty set. Uh, okay, but uh, I'm cheating here because it's least decoding, not unique decoding again. Uh, how to go from least decoding to unique de decoding? Uh, basically, this is not our techniques. It's uh, borrowing from uh, some uh, previous work by Dave Jaggi Langberg. It says that they work with binary channels, but uh, it can be adapted to RN. It says that for myopic adversarial channels, no matter RN or uh, F2 to the N, if a code is least decodable, with high probability, it's also unique decodable. Uh, why is that? Because, so again, so some code word is transmitted, and uh, some noise is added, a uh, Gaussian noise is added. Uh, they rece uh, James receives Z. So these, if he fixes some uh, attack vector, these code words in his uncertainty set are translated by S, and there are many decoding balls. I want to say that the number of confusing code words within the union of these decoding balls are very small. So namely, uh, so the union of these balls intersected with the coding sphere is like a, something like a blob. Uh, I want to say in this region, there are not too many code words within, within it. It just follows from uh, turn of bound. It's a volume argument uh, because the volume of this blob is not too large. Uh, but this is not the end because even if there are a few code words within these balls, but some code words, some confusing code word 
can confuse many code words inside his uncertainty set. This is bad uh, because I want a uh, small prob probability of unique decoding. So, so how to control such bad, confusing code words? It's just, you know, there can't be too many code words around any confusing code words around, uh, of distance square root n n. So it's again a list decoding argument, but in some sense uh, reverse list decoding. So there can't be too many code, code words within this uncertainty set that has, that has distance square root n n from this confusing code word. So these two steps coupled together allows us to show that if a code is least decodable, uh, it's also unique decodable. Uh, but uh, again, I'm cheating here because these confusing code words are outside of the Oracle given set, are outside of the uncertainty set. Because it can also be the case that some code word within the uncertainty set is confused by other code word within the uncertainty set. But now, these two code words are not independent. I mean, I can also assume, I, I can always assume that code words inside and, out, and outside of the uncertainty set are independent. But it's not, case we, it's not the case within the uncertainty set. So I need independence to conduct this turn off bound. So what if it's confused by other code words inside, uh, inside the Oracle given set? Well, uh, so here is a nice trick. You can, so there are two to the end delta code words in this strip. So I align them into a grid, into a matrix, using any order, any fixed order, whatever it is. It has nothing to do with the physical alignment of the code words. It's just any order. And I can do the two-step an analysis for each row and each column. This means that every uh, mutual confusability is covered, if you think about it. But the nice thing is that if I do the two-step analysis for each row or each column, for any row, I can assume that code words within this row and out of this row are independent. So again, I have independence. So what are the rows and columns? Are code words within the uncertainty set. These points are code words within uncertainty set. Is this a calculation tool? Sorry? Is this a calculation tool or is it part of the algorithm? Of uh, the no, it's, it's analysis. It, ha it has nothing to do with decoding algorithm. I mean, the decoding algorithm is just a bounded distance decoding, just a drawable and output, and find some code words inside. And it's definitely uh, not efficient. So that's basically it. So from the achievability side, uh, so we use myopic list decoding coupled with uh, some uh, meta theorem, sort of, uh, to go from list decoding to unique decoding. And on the converse side, uh, there are three, three types of uh, converse argument. So some open problems. Uh, basically, we only know how to analyze the, characterize the capacity when James is sufficiently myopic. Uh, so those uh, red and blue regions corresponds to sufficiently myopic regimes. It's a, uh, yeah. What if James is insufficiently myopic? Uh, so we don't know. As you can imagine, it becomes harder because uh, as the level of myopicity decreases, it uh, converges to the sphere packing problem, which is hard. So some intuition may, seems to tell, tell us that you'd better use private randomness to increase the uncertainty for James. Uh, but you, you better also let those code words correspond to one message to be clustered in some sense. So this is sort of like a superposition code, if you know. But uh, I tried it, but failed. It doesn't seem to work out. If you know how to, please let me know. Uh, so the second one is that uh, these things are not computationally efficient. If you want, can okay, we construct computationally efficient codes for such type of channels? Uh, so Winker and Adam Smith can construct, it, uh, construct computationally efficient codes for oblivious channels. Uh, can we do it for myopic channels? So the third one is that we can also uh, impose more constraints onto the, the adversary. For example, he can only observe his noisy observation causally. So namely his, uh, so he can, 
the ith entry of his attack vector can only be a function of his observation for now. Uh, the rate can only be uh, smaller. Yes? Sort of a streaming address? Yes, something like that. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? So, what do you mean this? Is, when, do you have to worry about, like, within the 2 to the n delta yes. possibilities? Why don't we need to worry about the rest of the cohorts that are within that distance? Within what distance? Like, the things that work in that substrate. Oh, it's outside of the uncertainty set. It's also, yeah, it's, we have already considered that, right? James knows it's not that, but like. Yes. So I, I guess that, that was the key, like, um, that was the technical, the, where the, te the, the unusual assumption you were making, like, actually played out was so that there would only be a small number of things in James's uncertainty set. So those code words are within that strip, but not within the Oracle given set, place the same row as other code words outside of the uncertainty set. I mean, uncertainty set is not the strip, it's just a subset of the code words within the strip. So I can assume uh, code words inside and outside the subset is, are independent due to condi conditional probability issues. Thank you.